Happy New Year. We are back for a special January show. Do you like the new look? Let us know in the comments. If you don't like it, well, um, don't say anything because we've gone fully down this road now with the new branding. So just suck it and see. Uh, My name is Harry Benjamin and this is the OMG MotoGP podcast. And we kickstart the year with my two trusty MotoGP experts, former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewen and Crash.net's MotoGP editor Pete McLaren. Uh, Nice to see you both both gents and oh well if you're not watching our youtube you can't see anybody uh but it's nice to hear your vocal tones too keith good good off season good christmas new year yeah probably you're better off not looking at me so don't go to youtube if you fancy it and <laughs> Pete ain't much better than i am he's just younger uh but at the end of the day, yeah it's been a good christmas i've spent it in the uk which is unusual normally we're we're away um we, we've always stayed in southeast asia obviously off the back of the macau grand prix as was used to be um we would stay out in in anywhere down that, that end of the world. Um, it's warmer, it's nicer, and it's easier to get um, a suntan. As you can see from me, if you are watching on YouTube, I haven't had one this year. It's, well, I have. It's just rust. <laughs> <laughs> and Pete, where have you been? Where's your tan from? <laughs> <laughs> I've been riding motorbikes. So, yeah, I've, I've been having a good time over uh, Christmas New Year, um, enjoy riding in Thailand. So, uh, yeah. And then on to Sepang, uh, well, next week. So, uh, and then it all starts again. So, yes, it's uh, the off season is really coming to an end now. Yeah, as we gear up for the uh, longest season ever in MotoGP history. Uh, before we dive into uh, all the latest happenings, uh, we do have to start with um, some sad news. From the last week, uh, the eight-time World Superbike race winner, Anthony Gobert, has died at 48 years old. Keith, uh, clearly a, a great rider, but one who sadly struggled quite publicly with, with alcohol and drug issues. How do you look back on Anthony and, and his life and career? Well, it turned into a terrible mess, didn't it? But, uh, the, you know, uh, at one point, everyone was hailing this kid as going to be the next world champion, going to be the next great thing. And he really was something a bit special. And, you, I, I mean, Pete and I were talking a bit earlier on about the, the amount of press, the amount of time that has been spent and the amount of hits that any story to do with Gobert has had on Crash.net and on the rest. Um has been huge. It's been a huge story because I think motorcycle fans get behind a maverick, get behind a personality, someone like Gobot was. I'm not going to say how he was you know, just before he died because he turned into a, you know, a bit of a monster, to be honest. I mean, he mugged an old lady, mugged an old bloke, um, got himself in a right old mess, got himself in a bar brawl, which in the end very nearly took his life. They came around and beat him up with bats until he was to within an inch of. Um, he was in a mess in the end, but if we try to just, if we can, not forget that bit, but just move that bit to, to the side and talk about him as a motorcycle racer, he had what the fans love. He had that personality as well as the performance on track. He was an unusual, maverick, don't give a sod type of, of, of guy. And he amused the hell out of people. He got that sort of Australian maverick way about him as well. Um, but clearly all was not well in the back of his head. And he ended his life in the way that he did, which is, is, I think it's very sad. I mean, there'll be those out there that are harsh and don't know the circumstances perhaps behind Go, but that would say that he got what he deserved. Um, I don't think anybody deserved to end up in that mental state that he ended up in. Um, and I've never been near drugs, so I don't know. Well, I've been near them, but I've never had them. So I don't know how it affects you as a person how it changes you as a person and clearly it changed him in such a way that he couldn't survive without he, you hear all the stories about drug addicts and the like and the alcohol you know having the effect it has on people and the things that you will go to go through just to get that and that unfortunately was where he was in the end and it um it did for him in the end um but I'd like to remember him just as a great motorbike racer and one that could have gone far. The sad thing is, for me, the biggest sad thing is that he was going to be a great motorbike racer and it all fell apart because of drugs. He got drug tested, kicked out, you know, excluded, and that was the end. Done. Yeah. I was going to say, I think, you know, of all the tributes and uh, sort of comments that have come out, the one by Carl Fogarty sort of stood out, you know, he said he was the most naturally talented rider I've ever seen. I mean, there's, there's your tribute, isn't it? I mean, coming from Carl Fogarty to say that about a rider shows the amount of ability he had. But as Keith says, just uh, unfortunately couldn't couldn't keep on the straight and narrow and, uh, you know, still a career despite all of that. You know, eight World Superbike wins, uh, you, know, you know, all those AMA wins as well and, and 
and things like that. It, it was still a career that many people would have been quite rightly proud of, but uh, everyone knows that much more was surely possible with the amount of talent that he had. So, uh, yeah, very sad. Yeah, really sad. Well, all our thoughts uh, are with uh, Anthony and his family as well. Um, let's move on then to uh, current uh, MotoGP land news, and it is starting to gear up a little bit. Um, we've had two launches so far, Mr. McLaren. We've had uh, Grassini and Ducati. Grassini, I think the big one that everybody was watching because they've got uh, a little known rider called Mark Marquez lining up for them this time. Um, but I mean, to, to the, the naked eye, no massive change to that livery. It's quite a nice livery though. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, to, to be honest, it's pretty much identical to last year, isn't it? And as you said, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, they've, they've got the, the, the sort of their own sort of brand and look with that light blue and red. But I think people expected that that sponsors would come in on the back of Mark Marquez. He's the biggest star on the MotoGP grid right now. There were all these sort of mock-up liveries going around the internet, weren't there? Red Bull and all these other things, Red Bull having left Honda, it seems. So it looked like, oh, well, they'll go over to Grassini or something. But no, the, the, the sponsor list appears to be pretty much unchanged. And uh, they'll be in, as I say, the, the exact same livery really as last year. So uh, no title sponsor for Grassini. Um, I, I guess... You could say, well, that, that kind of opens the door. If they want to do some special liveries, they'll have a, a clean slate. You know, they do one at Mizano every year, don't they? A Fausto Grassini sort of tribute. Maybe they could do a few more of those kind of one-off liveries. But uh, yeah, a bit surprising, really, when you've got Mark Marquez on board, that uh, you don't have a title sponsor, I think. He don't look quite right, does he, in the Grassini leathers? I mean, you know, I'm a, I am ai love that pale blue, but Mark Marquez, he doesn't look quite like the animal that we know he is on a motorbike. He almost looks a bit subdued subdued a bit muted in that light blue he's going to grow horns and come out fighting there's no doubt in my mind about that i mean i thought the grassini launch was brilliant i like the grassini launch i think they did a bloody good job with it and the ducati launch today you know it is it, it's, it's all what it is but from a i don't know about you Pete, but i get kind of a little bit bored with these because at the end of the day they they, they launch for pr and it is the big launch and it's the big unveil but they're unveiling something that's going to be completely different by the time we get the qatar anyway everything will have changed a little bit um, when things kind of get jiggled about a bit. So I'm never quite so interested in um, in team launches as, as, as the press they seem to get. It's almost like it warms the PR side up and warms up the hospitality people and gets them all, you know, trundling away, trying to trying to get it back out there and get everything running again. And I think at the moment, I think you, t you touched on it, Harry. Um, fact of the matter is, is I don't think there's that much money about in the world generally. I think that, that I think that it is really, really hard at the moment to land on another big sponsor, another big deal. Um, I was at the Belfast Bike Awards, the Adelaide um, Belfast Bike Awards at the weekend, and had quite a long conversation with Michael Laverty, who was there because Eugene Laverty, um, he got a, he was inducted, I think, into the Hall of Fame or whatever it was. There was so much going on there and so much drink, I can't remember any of it. But um, the point being is, is that uh, MLAB they've lost Vision Track this year. Um, which was their big headline sponsor, and they don't have an immediate replacement now. They, you know, the the, the the big story is is that they will be all right, but losing a big sponsor, you know, the 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 cost of finance at the moment is huge. So your corporations that were geared perhaps to a slightly different rate of financing their their debt is 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 critical. Um, these things are, and people hold back, don't they? Even big corporations, they're suddenly going, oh, do we need to spend a million quid on something that we're not going to get a direct return on? You know, suddenly it, it has that effect. Vision Track have obviously decided to consolidate their business in the way that they have, which has excluded the, you know, the rather expansive team now of uh, Michael Laverty, the MLAV team. Add to that the fact that Mike Trimby is no longer with us, um, and I want to talk about her if I can in a little while. That Mike Trimby is no longer with us, and Mike Trimby was a a massive ally when it came to manoeuvring Dorna as much as they can be manoeuvred, into favouring a British team to try and make sure a British team was properly funded. And there's no doubt about it, Dorna have weighed in financially um, to Michael Laverty's team. I, th I think that's a, a, a sort of an open secret, if you like, um, as they have done in many other times. You go back to Jeremy McWilliams, if you like, and Dorna weighed into the team that he was in to make sure that they had a, a British rider on a motorcycle in the um, in Grand Prix. So I think that there, there are not such easy times coming for some of the teams that are a little lower than your headline guys. 
So the fact that you didn't see brand spanking new big crash bang wallop sponsors all over the side of the Rossini bike doesn't actually surprise me, even with Mark Marquez on board. Bloody excited also, he, it's going to be. He's still he's still wearing a, a Red Bull cap, isn't he? So they're obviously a personal uh, sponsor for, for Mark and Bain. But I don't know. You never quite know what contractual obligations they've got to sort of teeter around as well, especially with such a big move. Just to say, if there are any sponsors watching, you have a million quid and want to want to see it returned on a podcast, uh, we're, we're always looking for, for interest. And you have no idea how expensive Pete McLaren is. So <laughs> we really do need that. <laughs> I think our editor is the one that de- de- needs all the money for the amount of cock-ups he has to work out from uh, from me alone. So um, just to edit out. Um, I think I think the point as well is with Grassini is they're on last year's bikes. So they're on the 24 bikes. And the bikes for this year, everybody seems to be very quietly enthusiastic over the step they've made with the Ducati for 2024. So the 2023 bike, we know it's good. We know it worked well. Slightly disconcerting when you're reading. I think Pete, you carried a story in Crash this week that, that, that just might be today. Actually, I might have read it today. But the fact is, is that you're reporting as well. Exactly what we're hearing is that Bainaya's happy, Gigi Delinia, he's sort of nervously happy, which is always a good sign. Um, if you're nervously happy, it means that um, you might be there or thereabouts. It's just a question of whether anyone else has made any. I mean. I, if I was a factory team and, and Ducati were, were saying the kind of things or acting the kind of way they are at the moment, I'd be scared to death if they've made a step over what they've already got. Ha. So Valencia, they tried the engine, it seems. I mean, that because that's the priority, isn't it? If you're Ducati, I mean, now it's a bit different because Honda and Yamaha can change their engines. But normally, you've got to get the engine fixed because then you can't change it. So they tried the new engine. And, and as you say, it sounds like they were all impressed with it. And Valencia is a small track. It's not really a track where you're going to really notice a, a big engine improvement, are you? There's no, there's no massive straights there, and yet they're already able to feel a benefit there. So, Banya was apparently very happy with the engine, uh, and then Gigi also teased that they've got something different coming with the aero. Uh, now, obviously, as you say, as you say, Keith, we didn't see, you know, the, the what was rolled out at the launch was not the new aero. I mean, it was last year's aero. All of the teams will be like that. Then they're going to keep it under wraps until basically the the Sepang shakedown when their test riders go out on it. And even then, you know, they're doing their best to keep the media away from the shakedown and, and, and everything else to keep it under wraps as long as possible. So there are other things coming there, which all points to, you know, those parts, they'll be putting them on there to go faster, won't they? So that is going to be a concern for the satellite bikes. Quite interesting that Mark at the Grassini launch, he, he mentioned that, you know, he was bigging up, as you'd expect, let's say the his rivals and sort of playing down his own chances, saying that, that Banyaya and Martin, you know, look at these guys, they're, they're super fast on this bike, they've got all this experience. And he said, and they're on the 24 bike. And then he sort of checked himself. Now, whether it was a slip of the tongue or not, but, you know, that is potentially something that, that, that's going to be an issue this year, isn't it? If, if Mark is racing with these guys, people are going to say, yeah, but he's on the year old bike. Or has he got the latest start system? What, what are the differences between his bike and the factory bikes? That's not going to be a, a topic of conversation that Ducati are really going to want running throughout the season, is it? So anyway, it was sort of sort of slipped out there by Mark in the conversation. But um, yeah, I mean, we've got to wait and see. The other thing interesting, actually, that Mark said was he's still unsure what style he's going to have on this bike. Will he be aggressive like in the past? He said he hasn't really had the chance to, you know, he's been careful at Valencia. He had one bike and they told him if you, if you crash it, that's it. Test over. You know, he was used to having four Hondas in the pits normally at a Valencia. <laughs> yeah. There was a bit of a difference for him. So, yeah, the mark we saw at Valencia, that very sort of subdued, smooth, but already fast. You know, as, as he said, his style will evolve over these next two tests. And uh, it'll be exciting to see, uh, yeah, what sort of Marquez is he still good? Imagine if he can dive on people on the brakes as he could on the Honda and then benefits with the drive out of the corners with the Ducati. What what a perfect mix that would be, but uh, yeah, I think first of all he's you know he's saying he's still got a long way to go. He's got to adapt to the bike, and uh, yeah, we'll see what he and Frankie Carcetti can come up with at Sepang. Big condition is as well is the Yamaha. Oh, sorry, that uh, Ducati are under an A category for concessions, which means that they're going to want, run what they've run right the way from the beginning. At the end of the day, it's not quite as big a panic as it used to be for the likes of Honda and Yamaha when we get the Qatar, because when we get the Qatar, that's when the homologation basically rules cut in and you couldn't make any changes to motors at all but we've got quite a big chunk of concessions to get over in the first half of the year that should bring Yamaha and Honda Honda at least into play 
haven't seen anything great from uh, Yamaha yet. So it's going to be a really interesting start to the year. And you're right, no one shows anything at this stage. That's why these press launches are never anything like that interesting because they're running, they're showing all the old stuff. They might as well bring them in there in black or something. It's uh, it's just a colour scheme type thing. We've gone for a new launch. We, we have. have. We, we could we have had a big press. Jinx. One, when, when we get the million pound sponsor, we will. Um, so you know, we will do the big the big press. And launch. Mark Marquez, the the beginning of the year, of course, you you, you you've got the data. That bike's got it's full of data. They've got everything they need to start the season in in the best possible way that that Mark can start it in, and he can he can make those tiny adjustments from that particular point. Where it all starts to move on is when the twenty four bike comes into its own, and they've got used to how to use the new data, the new stuff that they're 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 collating um, from the new twenty four motorcycle. So we'll wait and see. But you know, Ducati look as if they're in a really good place at the moment. I'm quite happy to see the concessions being what they are. Monday next week is the big meeting with Michelin. Because I've been banging this drum, you know, since this disqualification rule comes in for next year. If your tire pressure is is uh, drops below a certain point for a certain amount of the race, you are disqualified from next year. And if you look, it's funny enough. I was doing research before we came on air, chat. Yeah, you know, shock. And, and until until it was bloody um, amended, there was a fourteen point gap between Bagnaia and Martin when the the first set of sheets came out. And the second set of sheets that came out, the revised ones, there's a 39 point gap between them because it had all been adjusted by the time we'd had disqualifications. Uh, we've had adjustments regarding tyre pressures and the like. Next year, you're immediately disqualified. So you're in big trouble. Well, this year. Well, and what's going to happen is, is that, yes, yeah, what I meant this year. Um, actually, I keep thinking of next year as in this, se- yeah, next season, yeah. this season. Um, I apologise for that if I confused everybody. But it's, they've got a meeting with uh, Michelin and they're hoping that the parameter might open a little bit because th- there's no way that Dorner or anyone else want this to be a situation where we're getting riders disqualified. At the end of the race, you've got three guys up on the podium and then suddenly it's not those three guys, it's the three guys that were behind them that should have been on the podium. It will be a farce. It will be Formula One-esque. And we really, really don't want to be going there with that. Yeah, do you remember the, the Formula One thing where you've got 354 grid penalties for, for a gearbox or something and you added all these technical things up and and it just it just you know that in theory it was right they had to get them penalties but they just became so ridiculous everyone switched off from them and I wouldn't want to see that happen in, in motor GP and the point is is that Michelin need to meet the teams halfway with this I think this safety cutoff, this 1.8 bar or whatever it is, as the lowest level it can go for half the race, um, isn't going to work. And the reason for that is, is because in a pack, you can't judge where that tire temperature is going to go. It's it's a it's a nightmare scenario. And if they've not, if nobody's come up with some way within the rules of regulating that tire pressure to within the the parameters that Michelin set, and I haven't heard anybody that has yet. I'm surprised that I've not. We've not seen anything or heard anything um but there's a meeting on monday teams michelin erta gonna be discussing it again what do you think <laughs> yes well, well <laughs> that, that's quite you down <laughs> when you look at the list of warnings it's pretty scary isn't it what were there there's like 24 warnings or something over and it was this is only half a season of course the, the, re- effectively wasn't it that the actual warnings came in the first half of the season it, they didn't exist so obviously if you extrapolate that you go well there'll be double the warnings uh, and, and now there's no warning so everyone will be disqualified I don't think it's going to be quite as bad as that because of course the warning system meant that by the end of the year a lot of teams were actually looking to use up the warning weren't they and I mean that uh, I think the last three rounds saw something like 18 warnings and that's no coincidence that you know the previous three rounds had seen about four so it it sort of exaggerated it, I think, the warning system. But I absolutely agree with Keith. I think that the, the issue is that you can't expect the teams to, to magically know where their rider is going to be on the first lap of the race, the middle of the race, the end of the race, uh, whether they're going to be in a pack, whether they're going to be leading. I mean, it's out of their control, isn't it? And I think that's where it's almost, it's unfair to put them under the teams, under the technicians, especially the satellite team that doesn't have all the resources of the factory. To put them in. Let, let me ask you something. Let, let me ask you something, Pete. Let me ask you something, Pete, if I may. I mean, it, we're in the realm of artificial intelligence now. You know, I've never had any intelligence, so this is not a good place for me to be. But 
the point is, is artificial intelligence is getting greater I mean, exponentially. It's it's increasing in its influence over things. We must be getting close to a situation where this, all these kind of problems and the models that they they can build with AI, are getting to the point where we're going to be able to get over a lot of this stuff just by using AI trying to work it out. It's going to be where we've got technicians trying to crunch the numbers and trying to work it out almost by analog means. I know it's not, but but by pen and pencil, we're suddenly moving into a phase in life, but particularly in racing and a cutting edge like this is where AI is going to start taking over these kind of problems and sorting out these kind of problems. I mean, this whole next few years, we're going to see so many changes in racing because of the technology that's emerging and the way it's emerging and the speed of what it's emerging at. I wonder what we're going to have in the end. We're going to be racing hoverboards in like two years' time or something. It's going to be you know, something out of back to the bloody future. I I, 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 I kind of worry about where we're going. We've got a very thin rule book, and I don't think there's any sections in it that says about AI or that you know, the, the bits and pieces that are going to interfere with our rules moving forward. Well, you know what? They tried a few years ago something called um, Robo Race, uh, which was sort of Lucas Degrassi, who was part of the Formula E championship, sort of spearheaded it. And it was a car basically without a driver, right? Yeah, and, they're, doing, they're doing well in California, aren't they, for Google? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. But it, it was it's, that was supposed to sort of obviously uh, highlight how great the the electronics of the car are and how far we've come. But also it was designed as a way of, you know, a mechanics and an engineer's dream because they didn't have the varied component of a driver in in, in the driving seat. But where, where's the interest? Like from a in a broad fan perspective, you know, when you watch motorsport, no matter what it is or any kind of sport, it, it, it's it's the it's the athlete it's the person it's it's the backstory that makes it for you and I, I you know AI is a worry and I think about it a lot as well but I don't think that could ever quite well I think something. I think what the point I was trying to make is is it's where the technology leaps forward where suddenly within our rule structure um, they manage to find um, advantages in in places that that we humans haven't yet really thought about is my point is is where where does it go when AI is advancing the you know the Gigi Delinio? I mean, you plug him into something, and he's like he's like streetlights ahead of of, of most thinking. Um, and maybe maybe it's going to going to have a bigger effect than we think. You know, the likes of when I I mean, I've always felt slightly sorry for Danny Aldridge and and his team. You know, that that there's one or two men that are the technical side of things, and you know he's got to police. You know, all of the manufacturers, it's like they sort of, I know they all have to agree so that they have to find a level that they all agree on before they can make a move on it. But the likes of Danny Aldridge and co are, are trying to manage this. And now and now we've not got Mike Trimby at, at the helm. You know, Danny Aldridge and Jeff Dixon have now basically taken the two top roles within Urta. Um, there is not going to be a figurehead as there was with Mike Trimby. Mike Trimby is irreplaceable. There was no, no way that you could ever replace Mike Trimby within Urta, um, you'd have to train some CEO up from wherever. So what they've done is they've, they've, they've made it so that, I think Jeff Dixon's now senior general manager and senior sporting manager is Danny Aldridge. They've worked together for 30 years. They know each other really well. So there's a, there's a real symmetry between the two of them and they'll work that forward. And they've, they've juggled uh, quite a lot of the other team about as well. Paddock manager, uh, you know, slightly different. They brought on a fellow called Charlie King, who's come in as, as well to, to, to beef up the, the action there. But all of these guys are obviously thinking the same as we are. Where are we going? Where's it all headed? It's, it's, it, these rules and the like have got to be kept um, within the realms of, of what's possible now rather than what's, what's going to happen if we, we, we start to change them. We talk about tyre pressures. What about everything else? I mean, there must be so many things that if you've got big enough budget and enough brains and enough AI working on it, you're going to find other ways around certain rules as well um hopefully it'll be for the betterment of the sport rather than uh, just the tech guys i ramble again don't i i run off on one it's a new year and i, I said i wouldn't well no it, i, I it, it didn't work yeah no we're back to where we were always um but i wonder pete if there's some way you know i i make the comparison of when you're at 
university which i know not everybody might have gotten to but when you when you when you go to university and you have to submit now these days you know your your coursework or whatever is online they have this thing i think it's called turn it in where it does a check of how much it thinks your work has been plagiarized from the internet or whatever it might be and now they do this thing where it searches for have you had ai assistance so i wonder pete if there's a way of sort of almost motor gp implementing something like that where it sort of has a buffer being like well any new designs or whatever you're allowed 10 percent ai flagged but no more than that i mean ai is already they're already using it so the ducati launched today they're sponsored by lenovo and lenovo are quite open about it. they're using ai because you imagine all of this data that's that's being gathered at the racetrack it would take a human if they were just working through a spreadsheet manually it would take them a lifetime to go through. So they use AI. AI is, is already sort of shortcutting the sort of data analysis process and, and, and speeding things up with, to get through all these tons of data. So it's already part of the race team system and, and things like that, using AI in, in that respect. Um, and I think that's the obvious use for it, or initially anyway. As you say, the sky's the limit for where it will go. But at the moment, that, that certainly it seems quite established. I think a couple of years now that Ducati have sort of been been taking advantage of that that technology to sort of crunch the numbers for them and not only crunch the numbers who knows what else it maybe it, it does suggest things who knows i mean obviously we don't know exactly how they use it but uh, they are definitely using ai um and i think the difficulty with the tire pressure thing is that no matter how much you used ai to tell you okay this is the pressure that you'll need it will all depend on the start you get won't it still and it can't look into the future. It could tell you exactly the the starting pressure if you're in tenth place, ninth place, or wherever on the first lap. But you don't know, and and that's the great bit coming back to the human angle and uh, what you were saying about the, the the car racing series that that didn't have any humans. I mean, this is where the whole thing falls down because <laughs> they they can't actually use those numbers because they don't know exactly where the ride will be on the first lap. And I think coming back to what Keith says in this meeting, that's hopefully where they'll find something is that. You know, when the when the race begins, tire pressure is out of control of the rider, isn't it? I think we can all agree on that. There's nothing they can do. You know, you. you I can... wonder. I, I wonder, Pete. There is nothing they can do if they're head down and racing for it. And unfortunately, with the the way that our sprint races and our races go, there's very little time to be. There's no strategy in it. It pretty much balls out from the from the lights out. I, I wonder if there's a you know some of the teams have. have uh, managed a better management, better better monitoring system for for a rider, so that a rider maybe has to move out into the air or has to has to to move themselves around a little bit more on the racetrack. I wonder if they've you know got some finesse coming um, during the course of the year this year. I think they have warning lights, don't they? If so, they know yeah. that if they're under for too long. But I mean, yeah, it, it seems to vary. Some riders say, "Look, there's nothing you can do." You can do. I, mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I guess if you are. You know, you could drop behind people. We certainly saw riders that seemed to be riding a little bit tactically. And uh, for example, if you were concerned that you might be under, the thing to do would be to follow another rider for more than half distance and then take the lead rather than trying to break away early, which would then lead you vulnerable, wouldn't it? If you took the lead on lap one and then led all the way to the finish, you might run the risk of being under pressure. Whereas if you knew, well, hey, I'm in second place here. I've got the speed to overtake the lead, but you know what? I'll just wait do it after half distance. So I'll run a high tire pressure right behind this other bike, then I'll take the lead. I mean, if, if you have that much control of the situation, I suppose you could do it. But um, yeah, it's, they're pretty hectic MotoGP races, so it's it's be quite difficult. Hmm. Well, uh, AI, who knows? That would have been really handy for commentary, actually. AI, <laughs> AI commentary notes. Or it could replace us, actually. It could just completely Easily. replace us. <laughs> oh, dear. I've already been replaced. <laughs> that's, not, that's not good news. That is yeah. not good news. Keith is uh, a whole ramp. <laughs> oh, God. Nobody wants that. <laughs> yeah, the real Keith, real Keith is down the pub. <laughs> it could be you handy, yeah. I've always I've always thought of doing a down the, down the pub commentary. Get everybody involved. Hey, I, in fact, well, actually, it, it reminds me of the Speedway. If you remember a fellow called Gary Havelock, Speedway World Champion, British guy, um, up from the northeast. I mean, Gary was an, is an absolute scream. He's just such good fun. And um, they decided on Sky to do this alternative commentary. So you had, you know, us in our suits, sat in the in the, in the usual sort of thing, and the, and and they would do commentary from just there. The two main commentators would be there. Then they had Gary Havelock 
in the stands. But he slowly but surely got pissed with everyone around him. And the next moment, he slur he's, 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 it was an alternative one. You could switch to his commentary. The same, same, same production, same, same video, same everything that was coming out from the track. So it was Gary Havelock. And in the end, he sat next to a blow-up doll with the usual startled look on their face. And, and Gary's commentating with these people, these monsters all around him. <laughs> I don't think and that Sky would have been the been, better commentary. I don't think it was, it was a great commentary from an amusement point of view, but I don't think Sky ever bothered to experiment with that again. Certainly Gary never did. Uh, well, maybe there's room for, for it on the, uh, maybe, on the OMG maybe, cycle maybe there, next there year. Go. I'll buy you one of those exactly. dolls. You can do it with that. <laughs> You got some back in your in your garden, haven't you? In the shed nah. at the back of the garden. No, no, nah, oh, gone. Um, right, before we tread down that road anymore, uh, we're pretty much at the end of this little January special. There is just enough time uh, to have a little look through the uh, the mailbox, which I'm sorry to say is there's quite a lot in there which we haven't got to. Um, but uh, we've got a new. Uh, well, this is me going into the mailbox. There is there is a all lot his, in his here. Popcorn. All he all he does is sit and watch telly all day long. No, it's a mailbox. Letters <laughs> upon letters upon. I just can't get through them. Or so Where's many. The pigeon? Where's the pigeon that brought them? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> that's that pigeon noise. Anyway, uh, right. Here, let's go. Here we go. Here's one. Uh, Puppies and motorcycles asks: Are the two-year rider contract deals gone for the most part? As there are too many excellent rider choices now. Who wants to tackle that one first? Well, I can I can tell you that um, as we have clearly seen during the course of the year, a two year contract isn't necessarily a two year contract anymore, um, and that is because the rider scene is looking so healthy from below that below the scenes. I think that you know everybody. If you're unhappy in in any kind of contract, sporting contract, yeah, why why would you stay in it if the team's unhappy or if the rider's unhappy? And I think we've seen that 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 can be can be changed. Um, you know, Digi was out of work. <laughs> found himself some and he deserved to. So I'm quite pleased that it's a bit more loose than perhaps it might be if you take just the legal side of it. Yeah, I think the, the, the these new contracts that we'll see for this year, uh, and we should say there was nothing from Banyai at the launch today, was there? There was always the possibility, you know, if he followed the, in the footsteps of his mentor, Valentino Rossi. Rossi always liked to get titles out the way before the season began, get all that distraction put to one side. Nothing from Ducati today. So uh, Banyai is clearly uh, happy to wait a bit longer I suppose um, but yeah I think we'll see two year deals but again as Keith says whether they actually serve those two year deals and all the clauses and get out things that might be in them who knows it, it, but again and again as Keith says there's no point keeping someone to a contract if they don't want to race for you and vice versa so um, yeah we, we saw a mix, of, a mix didn't we we saw Rins who did have a clause to leave Honda so that was you know a clause that was in there and he, and he, he activated it and then you had a situation like Mark Marquez where, you know, he had a contract and they actually had to release him. So th there was a full range of things. And uh, yeah, it just proved that, look, you know, if you don't want to be together, there's no point forcing people to uh, to stay together. I do think that there ought to be a time schedule in there, though, like we have in some other sports where you've got a cutoff point where deals have got to be done by a certain time. Because um, it seems sometimes that it gets a bit messy later on in the year and, and Riders get dropped at a time that they can't rescue a career. I think that's something like a deadline day. Yeah, it's a bit of a deadline day. I think well, it can work both ways. That can that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. In in the case of Digi, if there was a deadline day, Digi would be out of work now. He would not not have a contract. So I, I'm reeling myself back in from this one now because <laughs> I'm well, so weren't. glad he has got a job. <laughs> you were you were off the fence and now you sat back on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But a good question there. Thank you very much. Uh, Dave has asked, uh, have MotoGP ever considered mandatory mud guards for rain races to reduce the spray? Seems it would reduce some of the danger in those first laps when everyone is so close. I think you've got such a vacuum behind a bloody powerful motorbike that's travelling at 200 mile an hour. That's, you're going to have a bit of a job to get rid of the vacuum that sucks it off the ground. Um, I, I think that uh, mud guards are not really... Um, Aerodynamically, I don't think they're going to really sort out that vacuum behind, particularly now with wings and the like as well, which are obviously uh, having an effect on all of the aero around a motorcycle. Um, we've become a little bit like cars, really, haven't we, when it comes to the, the aero situation. Um, I don't think a mudguard system... I mean, they were, again, I was talking about Speedway a bit earlier on. You remember when they, they, they came up with the dirt deflector, didn't they? Just a, 
a thing that hangs down behind the rear tyre to keep the dirt from rooster tailing right up in the face of whoever it is behind. Keeps the dirt on the floor, but um, dirt has a bit more gravity attached to it than um, spray, and it really is just a mist that comes out from behind the bikes. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is frighteningly difficult. I mean, and it has always been an issue, even when you go back to the time before Aero. Air, you know, when you're in a pack of motorcycles, and, and we never had lights or anything like that on the back of them like they have now, um, you were riding in, you know, I can't even imagine how the bloody hell we did it, to be honest with you, because it is actually madness. You are in a massive group, and particularly back then, there were even more bikes on the track, track than there are now, and you cannot see side to side in front of you, you know, six foot. If anything happens built, in front, Built different back in your day. Well, it was a bit slower, but what <laughs> the difference between 160 mile an hour and 230 mile an hour Sounds like a lot, but either way, you wouldn't want to get off. Not in those conditions, especially. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Dave, for that. And one more to round things off. I hope we're not too late with this one. It's come in uh, from... Oh, I've lost it. Where's it gone? Russell, there you are, Tom. Back. I've lost it. Oh, God. Uh, Tom, here you are. Uh, I'm planning a trip for me and my wife's 20th wedding anniversary to Portugal over uh, my wife's spring break, which, lucky for me, is the same weekend as Portimao. We have never been to Portugal and was hoping for recommendations of what kind of ticket to get, uh, what a grandstand ticket gets, where to stay uh, and what to do after we leave the track, what's around there. So general sort of insight into support them out we'd obviously do this for our insider's guide when we actually get to the weekend of but i imagine you might want to know why before you book so so what have we got keith what have you got and pete actually because you're going that's one of the races you're going to isn't it so uh so we'll, we'll come to you on that as well portugal's great i mean it's a great it's, a, it's perfect atmosphere where it is is you know there's there's not a lot goes on around there but there's there's plenty enough to be spending your first week there i would imagine anyway but hotel recommendations i can't do that I, i'm not really familiar with it i've only been there for one day at a time so it's literally one of those ones that, that I don't have the expertise in the hotel department. Um, but as far as a track and spectating is concerned, I mean, there are loads of places around there. Is it, you know, it's quite often that preference is difficult, isn't it, when it comes to where you sit? You know, some people, they want to sit at the end of a straight when you pick up 200 and whatever it is miles an hour. They want to see the braking area. Others want to be on a on a, a parts of the flip-flop or where someone's got it nice and sideways everywhere. It's It's a real preference. What what type of part of the racetrack you you want to sit and watch? The ones that I never understand are the ones that sit in the grandstand opposite pit, opposite the pits. You think, what are you doing? Halfway down a straight looking across at garages. I just don't get that. But anyway, that's just me. Like, they like to watch everyone at work, don't they? It's, it's, quite, it's like people watching almost, but it's slightly more interesting, people watching. But you're there for racing, not watching the bloody people meandering about in the back of a garage. Anyway, yeah, but that, for, like some, I, that's, for some, for like some, that's I quite said, interesting. Like I said, each to their own. Of course, you Formula One guys, you like to watch nothing because that's what happens most of the time. <laughs> 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 right, moving swiftly up. Pete, you're going to Portimao, aren't you? What, what what tales can you regale us? What are you looking <laughs> well, forward to? I've only been once before, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, great. Great country. That was my, my first time there. It was actually last year. So, uh, yeah, you can get to uh, the track. You could fly into Lisbon or, or Faro. That's how you pronounce it. Apologies if it's not, which is the local airport. Uh, both of them are within driving distance. Uh, Accommodation-wise, there's a lot of, I mean, Airbnbs. I, I would think hotels, there's there's loads of choices because it's it's out of the holiday season. It's obviously by the coast, by the seaside. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think you have difficulty finding anything. Track is easy to get to. Parking, fine. Uh, you know, real obviously you've seen on TV, real up and down track, fantastic to watch from. I think, as Keith was saying, I don't think you'd want to pick one place to watch. I think you'd want to move around. I mean, you want to roam, yeah. Yeah, when I got out and had a bit of a wander on one of the practice sessions, yeah, great place to spectate from. And uh, um, yeah, so so really just just move around and uh, have a look. Um, but but yeah, I, I food food great and 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 a very cheap place to go. I would say as well. I I, I thought it would be quite an expensive place for some reason, Portugal, but no. Um, very affordable and, and fantastic food. Yeah, a, good, a, a very good one to visit, I would say. And apparently well, a lot of golf clubs. Yes, yes. Uh, people that I saw in the restaurant. Into, you're into golf. Yeah, yeah. Everyone else that, or, or sort of, uh, of a certain age that was uh, in the restaurant that was uh, all there on a golfing ho- holidays. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. 
You're absolutely oh, right there. There you go, Tom. Well, if you if you like your golf, Tom, bring your clubs along. I'm sure you can hire some. And if the, the food's cheap, that means you can spend a bit more in the hotel. I, I hear the Ritz is lovely in, in that part of the world. So I'm sure I'm sure your wife will enjoy that for your 20th wedding anniversary. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've got to close the mailbox for today. Uh, we will get through more as we go. I am aware there are questions that have not been answered, but we just we just run out of time every time. Um, but they are on my list. Don't you worry. We're not forgotten about you. Um, we're out of time, though, for January's special edition lots more launches to come uh, in the next few weeks we're going to be back in february for another one off and then we're going to be up back and running uh, to the usual uh, beat from march onwards when the season begins and we've got some uh, few surprises in store as well what we've got a down content. the pub and we've got, got another a down, down the pub, pub coming in between that uh, which uh, you can have a look on you can buy tickets for that we might even run a competition through our social medias if we can no promises but we'll talk about that off air um let's wrap it up we're out of time pete mclaren thank you so much as always and to you keith ewan i've been harry benjamin you can get in touch in all the usual ways at ong moto gp on our socials email us a question and add it to that mailbox it's ong moto gp at gmail.com actually if you want to skip the queue on questions voice note your question because you'll go straight to the top of the queue that way if you voice note it uh, and then we'll play it out live on the show uh, subscribe download all that jazz and we'll be back in feb see you then